Mike Menser was a bodybuilding genius and one of the sport's most prominent and inspirational characters. During his short-lived career, he was the first bodybuilder in history to receive a perfect score of 300 and was famous for popularizing the high-intensity training technique that is still being discussed to this very day. Mike was as controversial as he was enigmatic. He was known for going against the grain and for his disdain towards the IFBB after a loss that derailed his career and marked the beginning of his downfall. It seemed like Mike and his younger brother Ray Menser had won the genetic lottery and were destined for greatness. But life was anything but easy for the Mensers. The pair died early in their mid to late 40s. Ray suffered from a rare and debilitating kidney disorder, while Mike was a victim of drug addiction for many years. Going from bodybuilding to superstardom to being institutionalized, arrested, and written off as crazy by those who were once peers, friends, and associates. This is Mike Menser's story of dedication, tragedy, and redemption. I guess a logical point would be to start with, how did you first learn about bodybuilding and how did you first know that this is what you wanted to devote a large portion of your life to? I was at a drugstore with my mother in my local, in my hometown of Effort of Pennsylvania and while she was off doing some shopping, my, I was looking over the magazines and all of a sudden my attention was arrested by the sight of a muscle man and I knew instantly there was no lag time, this is what I was going to be. Fascinated, he asked his mother to buy the magazine, then ran home and devoured it. Later that year, his dad bought him his first set of weights as a Christmas present. He spent the entire holiday lifting weights in his basement. Impressed by his commitment, his dad contacted one of his friends, John Myers, who invited Mike to train with him and his workout partner in his highly equipped garage gym. The two men came from a strength background. One was an Olympic lifter and the other was a power lifter. They encouraged Mike to train hard and had a massive influence on him as he considered himself not just a bodybuilder, but a strength athlete as well. My early interest in weights extended beyond bodybuilding to Olympic lifting and powerlifting. My hometown, including the entire state of Pennsylvania, was influenced highly by the fact that the father of American weightlifting, Bob Huffman, operated out of York, which is only 30 miles from Ephrata. As a young teenager, a friend of my father's, Johnny Myers, who was a powerlifter, would take me on frequent visits to Muscletown, as York was called, to watch the nation's and world's best Olympic lifters, powerlifters, and bodybuilders train. In 1965, Myers took 13-year-old Mike to New York to witness the very first Mr. Olympia contest. There he met Dave Draper and Larry Scott, who won the title that night and would go on to win it the year after. It was almost a religious experience for Mike, and that exact moment sealed his mind that one day he would become Mr. Olympia. Upon returning home, he sat down with the latest Muscle Builder magazine and set out a future schedule for his bodybuilding career on the inside cover of the magazine. Mike Menser, Mr. America 1972. Mike Menser, Mr. Universe 1974. Mike Menser, Mr. Olympia, 1976. While his dates and predictions were slightly off, this list highlights Mike's early ambition. Such an ambitious kid was the product of a family of German origin. He had an older brother and sister, and a younger brother, Ray, who would follow in Mike's training shoes. In school and later in university, Mike distinguished himself by virtue of his remarkable grades. He was a top student, one whose ultimate goal was to become a psychiatrist. But before embarking on that pathway, he threw himself into amateur bodybuilding. I started competing at the age of 18 in a local physique contest, which I did very well in. I won my first contest, which was the Mr. Lancaster County, Pennsylvania contest. Not long thereafter, I went to the state level and won the Mr. Pennsylvania. In June 1970, he enlisted in the Air Force. And the following year, he made a contact that would change the trajectory of his life. At age 19, Mike entered the 1971 Mr. America contest, but another 19-year-old was destined to take all the glory and make history by becoming the event's youngest ever winner by a handsome margin. A sensational KC Viator scooped up the 1971 Mr. America title and all the best body part categories while Mike finished 10th overall, coming second to KC in the best legs and best arms categories. 
Casey was a student of the eccentric inventor and mastermind behind Nautilus, Arthur Jones, who was beginning to promote his high-intensity training protocols at that time, with Casey being his most famous guinea pig. Casey saw something in Mike, later approaching him and telling him that he's got great genetics and put him in contact with Arthur Jones, who transformed Mike's thinking. There is and can be only one valid scientific theory of exercise. And it just so happens to be, as I learned 20 years ago, the theory of high intensity training. Prior to that time, I was training up to three hours a day, six days a week, making little or no meaningful progress. I had finally reached a point where I was about to forsake my bodybuilding goals. I couldn't justify spending four hours a day in the gym. I was already working 12 hours a day in the Air Force, working a part-time job trying to see my girlfriend as much as I could. I just couldn't justify spending one more hour a day in the gym. At that time, I was fortunate to make the acquaintance of Arthur Jones, who during a lengthy phone conversation explained to me in the most scrupulously objective language imaginable the theory of high intensity training, namely that to be productive, exercise has to be intense, brief, and infrequent. Those are the three principles of the theory. I recognized almost immediately that it was true, that I was not the expert on the subject I had thought I was. In fact, I came to realize I knew almost literally nothing of value about the subject of exercise. According to 13-year-old Mike's magazine inscription, 1972 would be the year he predicted he'd win the Mr. America title. But circumstances had a different opinion. Due to both a severe shoulder injury and increasingly more responsibility in the Air Force, Mike was virtually inactive from bodybuilding, and by 1974, this inactivity started to get to him. He fell out of shape, and even when the injury cleared up, it seemed he might never compete again. Feeling depressed and fueled by the fear of reaching the age of 50, knowing that he could have been the best bodybuilder in the world but didn't even try, Mike kickstarted his enthusiasm. He left the Air Force and enrolled at the University of Maryland on a three-year program with the ultimate goal of being a psychiatrist. He went back to the gym in late 1974, and to get back into the action, he entered the junior Mr. America, weighing 190 pounds when he took first place, and it seemed like he was finally back on track. The 1975 Mr. America was being staged in L.A. by Franco Colombo and Mike arrived at the contest a hard and cut 195 pounds, fully confident he would win. But that confidence was dissipated in one swift stroke. As soon as he saw Robbie Robinson strip off backstage, he knew there was no way he's gonna win. And he was correct as he finished third behind Robbie and Roger Callard. Despite his placing, this contest represented a pivotal moment in Mike's career in life, because that's where he met Joe Weider. Weeder whisked the 23-year-old away for a photo and interview session, and Mike ended up on the front cover of Muscle Builder and Power. Mike later wrote a series of training articles for the magazine, explaining how he trained three times a week doing only three to five sets per body part, which caused a minor sensation among bodybuilders. How many hours a day do you have to work to develop a physique like that? Well, most bodybuilders train at least three hours a day, six days a week, but I only train a total of three hours a week. Okay, what do you do during those hours? Train very hard. Impressed with his writing, Weeder invited Mike to come out to California to work with him at Muscle Builder and Power, but he had to decline due to his college studies. The following year, true to the predictions he'd mapped out in 1965, despite being four years behind schedule, Mike was crowned the 1976 Mr. America. The Mr. America was the most satisfying contest win he'd ever had. I, I remember him telling me before the contest he would he would be awake just staring at the ceiling as if it was a movie screen and he could wow. see himself getting the trophy and all the hard training from age 14, the desire to be Mr. America to win it. He said the feeling was unbelievable. He said he actually had to fight back tears when he when he won the, the contest. Wow. And he said no other contest, including the 78 universe, which he won with the first and only perfect score, came close to it. He said it was wow. just it was almost anticlimactic, he said, after the American. But by 1977, things started to get tough for Mike. Studying up to 12 hours a day, while also working out, started to take a toll on him. And his worsening financial situation made things even tougher. Tired of being broke and growing disillusioned about becoming a psychiatrist, Mike decided to drop out. 
He later called Joe Weider and asked him if his invitation to go to California was still open, to which Weider said yes. Mike landed in Los Angeles by way of Vancouver, where he had won the Mr. North America contest the previous weekend. The winner in the North American Bodybuilding Championship medium class from Washington, D.C., Mike Mincer. Also judged to have the best arms, the best legs. He was appointed associate editor and muscle builder in power, and within a couple of months had launched his mail order courses, marketed under the heavy duty banner. They sold in phenomenal numbers. Although sidetracked by his relocation and expanding business interests, Mike still entered the 1977 Mr. Universe contest in France, finishing second in the heavyweight class. He did score a 300 perfect score yeah. in the prejudging, and yeah. then at the night show, they kind of disregarded the prejudging scores and they judged it on a, on a placement system. And I think Cal, or, uh, yeah, Cal won by one vote over Mike. But Mike knew that was the wake-up call, that if he yeah. didn't get his act together and win the universe in 78, that he could kiss his bodybuilding career goodbye. Feeling he'd not done himself justice in France, Mike went all out on the 1978 Mr. Universe staged in Acapulco, Mexico. At 215 pounds, he took the title with a score of 300, the first perfect score recorded in IFBB history. According to his 1965 inscription, he was still four years behind his title-winning schedule. But he was now a professional, and the pose for pay scene was just about to enter a new and more lucrative era. Three months after his universe win, Mike made a victorious start to his pro career by winning the Southern Professional Cup in Florida. Several weeks later, he finished second to Robbie Robinson at the Pittsburgh Pro Invitational, and followed that up with a third spot behind Robbie and Danny Padilla at New York's Night of Champions. But by the early summer 1979, bodybuilding wasn't a top priority of Mike's. The night before the Night of Champions, Mike had received bad news about the condition of his terminally ill mother. Then, two weeks later, she passed away. Devastated by the death of his mother, Mike stopped training for six weeks he ate all the wrong things and put on too much weight to the point where he'd barely looked like a bodybuilder. Four months away from the 1979 Mr. Olympia, Mike knew he had no choice but to pull himself together or he'd have to forget about making his Mr. Olympia debut. The 1979 Mr. Olympia was a duel of physique types. But more than that, it was also a clash of philosophies and generations, hitting the 37-year-old two-time reigning Mr. Olympia against the 27-year-old upstart rookie sensation. Coming off his Olympia victories in 1977 and 1978, Frank Zane was favored, but the competition was stiff. The rest of the lineup was loaded with some of the best bodies of the late 70s and early 80s. Until 1980, the Mr. Olympia comprised of two classes, over and under 200 pounds, with the two class winners then competing for the overall. And every time, the under 200 champ won. After pre-judging, future head judge and current president of the IFBB Pro League, Jim Mannion, said, if Menser doesn't win, it's a crime. While Serge Nuber thought that Mike is better, but Zane is the champion. Both men would then go on to emerge as winners for their respective classes and compete for the overall title. It was a contrast between the leader Zane and the fuller Menser. And if both had looked as they did at pre-judging, the nod may have gone to Mike, only if he had been just a little drier. But he wasn't the same. By all accounts, he had smoothed out. Frank would go on to win his third consecutive and last title that night. However, many still contend Mike should have won. They wanted to end the lightweight era then and there and give bodybuilding's ultimate title to someone who had built a bigger body. By the late 1970s, Mike had fashioned a physique that broke new ground in muscle density and ruggedness. The rock-hard musculature displayed symmetrically throughout his frame really did give the impression of unlimited power. A 1979 cover for Muscle Builder and Power that portrayed Mike as the reincarnation of Hercules precisely captured his bodybuilding persona. The same magazine served as the ultimate showcase of his unique, high-intensity training methods, 
His writing and ideas amassed a huge loyal following, and as the 1980s loomed, it seemed possible that Mike's popularity could eventually outstrip that of the great Arnold Schwarzenegger. This was during Arnold's pre-Hollywood superstar days, and many felt that Mike's growing prestige, combined with his training beliefs that went against Arnold's 20 sets of body part regimen, was the catalyst that drove the Austrian to seemingly dislike the young upstart. You would have to go back through Arnold's and Lee's training career and calculate the thousands of wasted hours, training hours, during which they made little or no progress. You would scratch your head and ask yourself the question, didn't they have anything better to do? He didn't like Mike. He didn't like the fact that Mike was not saying, oh, Arnold, anything he says about training is sacred scripture. Right. He was saying quite the opposite. You know, question everything, including what Arnold says. That didn't play very well with Arnold and his group. John, I, I forgot that story he said about the 76 America. He said every judge there gave him first place, except Arnold. Really? And Arnold gave Roger Kellard, who was his training partner. Training partner, yeah. The rookie juggernaut was poised to become the bodybuilder of the 80s. And with many witnesses unconvinced that Zane had actually beaten him in 1979, Mike was installed as the favorite for the 1980 Olympia. Going back to his 1965 predictions, Mike had predicted that the Mr. Olympia title would be his in 1976. And with his Mr. America and Mr. Universe wins being achieved four years behind schedule, a coincidence was lent to 1980 being Mike's Olympia winning year. But little did he know, it would be the end of his bodybuilding career and the beginning of his downfall. Digesting his 1979 loss, Mike planned to leave no stone unturned in his onslaught for the 1980 Olympia crown. If they want more definition, I'll give them more definition, he said. Mentally, he went into a different gear and was willing to do whatever it took to win the contest and it led him onto a dark path. He started dieting in February for the October contest, as opposed to dieting 12 weeks out as he previously did. He was consumed 24 hours a day by the thought, what can I do today in terms of training, diet, aerobics, and motivation to improve myself? He even started taking amphetamines, not to get high, but as ergocentric aids to facilitate his hectic lifestyle. He liked being a productive genius, as he put it. Mike didn't think there was anything wrong with his amphetamine use, even comparing it to how people consume stimulants like coffee. I think that drugs should be legalized. I believe very strongly in the notion that I was born a free, independent individual. I should be able to take anything into my body that I want to, even if it kills me, it's my business. The right. government has no, no business sticking its nose into private affairs. But soon enough, we would have to deal with the consequences. He went to the point where he, in his own words, was on death's door. He was so fatigued that he couldn't even raise his arms and had to stay in bed for the rest of the day before going back to normal the next morning. But to him, it was all worth it. Or was it? What a big day for this youngster from Austria, Arnold Schwarzenegger. From 1970 to 1975, Arnold won six Mr. Olympia titles. After the sixth win, he retired to focus on his burgeoning movie career, and everyone thought he'd moved on from bodybuilding, or so it seemed. So two weeks ago, I decided, well, I think it would be kind of an interesting challenge, really, to uh, do something in, in eight weeks that most of the guys do uh, of, in uh, preparing a year or two years in advance. In 1980, Arnold shocked fans and competitors when he announced that he was making a comeback only one day before the Mr. Olympia contest. Arnold, I saw him every day in the gym. He's looking better and better and better. So I started wondering, oh, what's, something's up here. He's not getting in that kind of shape just for a movie. There's something going on here. So I knew there was something. In, in, and when he showed up on the plane, too, I'm like, aha. Uh -huh. And that moment marked the beginning of the most controversial competition in the IFBB's history. Reactions to Arnold's comeback were mixed while Mike was furious. Other competitors like Frank Zane and Boyer Co. expressed pity that Arnold was going to return, lose, and tarnish his legacy. Two days before the contest, Mike had that same death's door feeling, which again confined him to bed for a whole day. But he was able to recover by the morning of the contest. He was 225 pounds and more cut than he'd ever been. 
What uh, what has been your proudest moment as a professional bodybuilder? The condition I attained for the 1980 Olympia. I had started dieting that year in February, and the contest was in October or November. I can't quite remember. But I had applied myself longer than I ever had to attaining top condition, and I really did reach a peak of condition. My muscle quality was the best ever, and that was my proudest moment. And what was your body fat level at that one? About a month before the show, it was 3.8, and I had lost a few more pounds of fat, so Jeez. I would guesstimate around 3%. On the contrary, many were shocked at Arnold's conditioning. The Austrian oak failed to compare to the new generation of stars. Although his chest, back, and biceps were back to their former glories, his legs, triceps, and midsection all lagged in definition and size. Some put him at 90% of his former glory, and some at 80%. But the general consensus among fans and competitors was that Arnold was no longer a threat. Joe Weider told me later that Arnold was on cocaine that day. And in looking at some of the photographs later on, I believe that he had a an unusually stressed look on his face. The veins on his forehead were extended. All symptoms of being on cocaine. I looked my best, but I didn't feel at my best, Mike said. It just didn't feel like a normal contest. No one was being their usual selves. There was a strain and tension in the air all the way through. That strain and tension came to an electrifying climax at the competitors' meeting held the morning of the contest, where 15 of the 16 athletes had signed a petition asking that the two weight classes be abolished and that the Olympia should be contested as one open class. The one athlete in disagreement was Arnold. At one point, Boyer Co. stood up as a gentleman and said, look, why don't we just let Arnold explain to all of us right here, right now, what his reasons are for wanting to have weight classes. Maybe we can get to the bottom of this instead of arguing aimlessly. And he did say it in a very gentlemanly fashion. There was no hint of malice or anything negative in his voice. Arnold sat back and, oh boy, why don't you stop acting like a baby, grow up and be a man, which I thought was uncalled for. So I said, look, Boyer Co. said that as a gentleman, something to that effect. He doesn't deserve that. And that pissed him off. He turned around very rapidly to face me, and he literally had his upper lip was curled around like that. He was snarling like an animal. He said, oh, come on, man, so we all know that you lost last year because of your big belly. I allowed that to irritate me perhaps too much, and on impulse, I ran over towards him. I was surprised. Arnold Schwarzenegger sat down. I scared him went over and sat in the corner and as I, when he went to sit down, I, I continued at him, I was wagging my finger at him and he could look me in the eye. He literally went from frantic, hysterical adolescent to shrinking away like an injured child. On stage, what Arnold lacked in muscularity and leanness he made up for with charisma, clever posing to hide his flaws, and jumping out of line to strike poses. To the surprise of everyone, the two finalists chosen were Chris Dickerson and Arnold Schwarzenegger. Frank Zane, the reigning champ, Mike Menser, the favored challenger, and Boyer Cole, who showed supreme conditioning, all failed to impress. Meanwhile, Arnold, who many said didn't deserve a top five finish, not only placed in the final two, but ended up winning the show. I'm extremely excited about uh, winning the seventh time the Mr. Olympia competition. And I have to be very honest that this was the highest level of competition I've ever faced in any competition in my life. That night, Mike finished in fifth place. As he received his trophy, you can see him furiously shouting, this is bullshit. Well, my immediate gut level reaction was paradoxical as it may sound was laughter. I just started laughing. It was ludicrous. So it was so obviously an incorrect decision that my first response was just to laugh. But of course, as the dust settled and I thought about it, uh, anger set in. I felt cheated. I think that Arnold would have his hands full if he were to compete uh, now, unless he really became really serious about his training and did all that was necessary for him to do to get in tip-top shape. 
But if Arnold were able to come back and win these contests after a short interval, it means that the support of the body mail has literally stood still for the last five years. This, in my opinion, is not true. I think what Mike carried was the bitterness of losing to Arnold. And it was not a subjective sport. And according to the criteria that he had, he should be the winner. Anything that exists in reality can be viewed, judged objectively. There are objective criteria for judging bodybuilders. The only people who saw Arnold as the winner were the seven judges and his closest friends. None of the other competitors saw him as the winner. None of the audience, or very few, only those that were his friends. I thought I should have won. A lot of people thought so. That was my lowest point. I knew my career was over right there. I'd always wanted to win the Mr. Olympia, and I was going to give it three or four tries. That was my second try, but because it did appear like it was fixed, and I wasn't going to go back again and get screwed. In the wake of the very controversial decision, fans and competitors were outraged. Television networks like CBS separated from the competition, and new rules regarding judging were set in place. Arnold's 1980 victory wasn't just controversial. It changed the trajectory and perception of bodybuilding forever. Zane and co. withdrew from smaller competitions in the immediate aftermath, while Mike retired completely. Following this incident, Mike's career began to fragment. In his seminars, he was openly contemptuous of the whole situation, a posture that he believes led him to being unofficially blacklisted by the IFBB, making promoters reluctant to book him. He also left Weeder Publications, and by 1982, his income had gone from 200000 a year to zero. In 1983, I left Los Angeles, where I worked for Joe Weeder and his Muscle and Fitness magazine, to go to Florida to work for Arthur Jones at Nautilus. I stayed there for a relatively short period, only six months, then I left his employ. Went to Europe, performed numerous exhibitions and seminars, came back, actually a year and a half, I published and served as editor of my own magazine, Workout for Fitness, which was a more general fitness magazine, soft core bodybuilding magazine, as I called it. That went under, and I went back to work for Weeder as a writer. Mike had worked on Workout Magazine harder than he'd ever done before in his life. He wanted to make it the best he could, often having to stay up for two or three days to meet the deadlines, while still using amphetamines to help him do so. And when the plug was pulled on it, he was devastated. It was a crushing blow. I'd put 110% into the enterprise and it hadn't worked out, he said. This, combined with the death of his father in 1985, completely crushed Mike. Well, right now I'm a little uncomfortable with my life because I don't have a strong goal orientation. In the past, I was always highly motivated day to day by my desire to become Mr. Olympia and a successful champion. But since that left my life, I find that there's a bit of a void, and uh, I'm a little neurotic at times. For five years, Mike was on a road to oblivion. At times, he was suicidal and regularly institutionalized. All forms of medication and therapy had proven impotent to his condition. Stories even began to spread in the bodybuilding world of a crazed Mike Menser indulging in increasingly bizarre behavior, running naked to the streets, prophesizing the end of the world, be arrested by the police numerous times and waiting for aliens to land. And while some of these stories weren't true, some others were. Remember one day I was walking to Gold's gym and Mike's in the gutter laying there like a drunken guy. I'm like, oh my God, Mike. He didn't hear me. I'm like, then he walked in when we were training and warming up, taking his pictures off the walls. And I said to my training partner, Tony, if I ever get like that, keep the pictures stay on the wall, okay? Don't let me do that. I was sort of making a joke, but I felt so sad for Mike. I'm like, Mike. You know, and then he sort of got a little better, and then he's like, he'd be sitting outside smoking a cigarette. I'm yeah, like, always between his clients. He'd train a client, come outside and smoke a cigarette. Mike, let's go. It's a second cigarette, please. I don't have $200 an hour pay if we, if we get late. I was worried about him. Like, wow, Mike, you know, he, he was the guy that, you know, he, the intellectual, the guy that was the scientist, he had a great mind. I'm like, what a great bodybuilder. That's the way we should be, you know? But as the 90s dawned, Mike had finally been amphetamine-free for 18 months. However, there were still occasions where the demons visited. One day in late 1994, Mike's close friend, John Little, received a call from Mike, saying he was in Las Vegas and about to fly to the moon to meet with Bill Clinton and discuss the world's problems. But upon visiting Mike, the psychotic episode was soon over. Despite that, 
Mike was establishing his personal training business at Gold's Gym, and his progress over the next few years was onward and upward. Since 1999, Mike's younger brother Ray had been receiving kidney dialysis and was awaiting a transplant. Mike offered to be a donor, but the doctors discovered that he had a very serious heart problem. This meant the transplant was off the table, and Ray would have to wait longer. As a result, Mike moved in with his brother to look after him. On June 9, 2001, Ray and Mike were working on their new training DVD called HIT. After a long and exhausting day of work, Ray went to sleep while Mike stayed working late. Ray was troubled by this because he knew his brother had heart problems and didn't want him to overtax his body. But Mike wouldn't listen. Eventually, as the fatigue set in, Mike finally decided to call it a day and turn to bed. The following morning, on the 10th of June, 2001, Ray found that his brother would never wake up. Mike had had a heart attack during his sleep at the age of 49. Ray was devastated as he went about making funeral arrangements. And on the morning of Tuesday, Joanne Sharkey, the general manager of Mike's business, received a call from Ray's dialysis unit that he hadn't turned up for his appointment. Upon turning up to his apartment, she found that he'd passed away at the age of 47, only two days after his brother. Despite his retirement and early death, which limited his contributions, Mike's life and writings still act as a call to question everything, discover what is best for one's body, and more importantly, train with purpose and intensity. And that alone makes Menser a worthy bodybuilding legend. Potential is only the expression of a possibility, something that can be assessed accurately only in retrospect. I advertise myself in bold print as bodybuilding's foremost iconoclast. Iconoclast means literally image breaker. In other words, you'll never know how good you might have become unless you try. So let's get with it.